Arena the Contest. And uh, tonight we're doing a, another class spotlight video, but this one is centered on the healer class, uh, as requested by the, uh, the viewers of the interwebs. So uh, anyway, we're starting off here with uh, my setup I got. Got the arena box and all that. But uh, the heroes we're going to be talking about tonight is Talia, the Druid. Just remember, these are all the, uh, the miniatures that came with the original arena of the contest. She, as you can tell, she's got like this snake thing. You know, that's kind of coiled around and everything. And I think she's going to have uh, something kind of similar to that for the reworked one. And then we got uh, Tamram, the cleric. Look at him. I think his miniature is almost, it's basically identically the same. It's just they did more detail on his, uh, uh, his miniature sculpt than what... Uh, what exists for this one, so should be uh, interesting. Then we got Ustar, the Necromancer. Ooh, look at him. Let's try to get the... There we go. Yeah, look at him holding a skull there and all that. Maybe a little challenging to tell uh, exactly in the, the webcam, but it's uh, it's it's decent, but his new model is going to be so much better. There's his hero card. He's the Necromancer. One of uh, the pretty coolest heroes for sure. And then we got Jade the Bard. Got a little guitar there. She's ready to play some tunes for the heroes and uh, ready to, to rock out on the battlefield. And here's her card. She is a very fun hero that's for sure all right and uh, I thought I'd pull out a different miniature than I had last week for people that uh, maybe haven't seen all of the original miniatures this is what is considered the core box uh, dragon or the core dragon sometimes referred to uh, I think that he's gonna be he's gonna be the green dragon right code yeah, they switched him to the Green Dragon. Yes, his model is uh, officially the Green Dragon. And if you got, oh, what was it? You got essentially the, one of the, the biggest bundles that included everything, I believe. You got this guy for free painted. So you don't even have to, to worry about that. Oh, there was actually one little thing I wanted to bring up before we jump into uh, our spotlight video. So... This is one of the, the uh, add-on points that was uh, talked about, um, you know, in Dr Dragori's, uh campaign of having uh, tokens essentially for each of the classes that are simplifies, you know, being able to get it. So I thought I'd show you the situation in my game box here. As you'll see, there's just all these these tokens in here I keep all the 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 heroes in this one so it's a little easier to for me to to get them but obviously it's just kind of like thrown in there so if I'm looking for some guy like okay I'm gonna pull out all the heroes here uh, healers okay well here's a green one and there's another green one and um, you know oh, okay here here's Talia now and there's uh, uh whoa wait I think Jade's in here Oh, wait, no, there's alternate Talia. We'll talk about that eventually. And then here's Jade. So, you you know, you could look through it that way. But if you're looking specifically for, let's say, Ustar was, was buried in there, Jade was buried in there, a little challenging to find exactly which one you need. So uh, having the new token set up with uh, just generic healer symbol and everything is going to be pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, there's a point. <laughs> also, there's a doggo. Are they part of the core box too? I'm get. I'm going to guess that this is, uh, uh, one of our discord members because <laughs> he's the only person that calls, uh, any character doggo. Um, uh, yes, yes. He, he's part of the core box. You're specifically talking about, um, 
Cedric. Yeah, which was under our brute video that we did previously. All right. Well, anyway, so we're going to talk about the healers tonight. They are, uh, you know, I've, I think I mentioned before about how there's certain core uh, classes that are, in my opinion, very fundamental to have. Uh, the the damage dealers are, uh, such as the brutes and the shooters, are those. The healer is very important. And uh, I'd probably throw in maybe maybe a tank as tanks possibly as a core, but maybe a little less so on that side. I, I could see one of the others, but when I say that, usually I mean that you gotta essentially have one of those to have a pretty good team composition. Uh, you gotta have at least a shooter or a brute or a healer to uh, be able to play pretty well in this game. So. All right. Oh, the reflection of the dog in your. Oh, yeah, that's. <laughs> yeah, those those are my dogs. Uh, I don't think they're gonna come in the uh the expansion, but uh, who knows? I mean, I guess there's uh always possibilities. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there's my dog over there, uh, Luna. Who knows? Maybe she'll make it into the campaign. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so healers. Here we go. So this is from the compendium that we've talked about before. It tells us all about the different quote unquote objective stats. So their line is fear, not their power. My magic won't let you fall. Okay. All right. So we're going to start with Tamram the Cleric. Healer with the best healing potential of the game, including out ongoing healing. He also applies great defensive effects and removes debuffs, ideal in healing strategies that focus on buffing and protecting a single hero. All right, so you can see he's got one offense, which is, you know, obviously the lowest possible damage. Defense is actually really high, especially for a healer character. There's one down from the bottom. Mobility is all the way at the bottom. Uh, effects, which we talked about before effects are essentially conditions and uh, different possible effects that are applied to uh, different heroes or themselves and then handling is that objective stat for saying uh, how easy it is to play a hero so highest handling means that it's an easy character to play so uh what Dragori is suggesting is that they are a very easy uh healer to play which is uh relatively pretty true i'd say so we'll we'll get into the details here all right so we got uh the the healer class so they have all have 60 hit points uh six for six for basic attack seven defense five movement their passive is called hope it triggers on hitting on a target on the first hit of your turn. And the effect is an ally within range may regain four hit points, but it can't regain hit points again this turn. All right, so this is actually going to be a pretty important point here uh, to talk about. And we're going we're gonna to do a little bit more into uh, looking at rules than what we usually do. Um, but we're just we're gonna do this real quick because this is actually pretty important. Uh, in my opinion, it's an item that needs to be stated more in this game because it's often a little hazy for people that are starting out. But this section right here, the attack timeline, is probably one of the most important uh, uh, pieces of information for you to have. Um, so the reason why is oftentimes with this uh, hope passive is it says an ally within range may regain four hit points, it's great, but it can't regain hit points again this turn. So what does what exactly does that mean? Well, if we look at the tact timeline, we're gonna skip the preparation phase and then the striking phase because it doesn't apply for this one. We're gonna go, you know, hit or miss, so it's a hit. You'll see the first thing under hit is apply passive power effect. So what that means is when Tamram does one of his abilities, such, you know, let's say he's doing a uh, sanctuary on uh, Cedric, for example, um, he makes the attack against the enemy. And then 
the first thing that will happen is hope triggers. So then Tamram can put that four hit points on, let's say, uh, I don't know, it, it could be anybody. Um, let's say uh, uh, Juliet is on his team. So he can heal Juliet for four, but the effect for, uh, let's, let's say it was Sacred Flame instead of Sanctuary, sorry about that, is uh, since on Sacred Flame there's an effect of healing f uh, eight hit points, Juliet would be unable to get the eight hit points from Sacred Flame. So we'll, uh, we'll go over to those items, but I just thought I'd kind of clear that part up uh, real quick first because that is often uh, a very confused and um, a rule that's not applied correctly all the time, and it, and it is actually pretty important when you talk about the healers. All right. So let's jump right into Tamram here. So his uh, primary ability is Sacred Flame. He's got all ranged attacks of one enemy, six damage. So obviously very low damage. It's uh, probably one of the lowest uh, primary attacks in the game, obviously because his basic attack does the exact same damage, but his effects are uh, significantly better, of course. So his first effect is removing from an ally within range all temporary effects applied by enemies. What that means is let's say um, we're going back with our example. Juliet is on Tamram's team. Juliet has been cursed by, let's say, let's go over from the one of the heroes that we did last week. Um, wasn't wasn't there someone that uh, maybe maybe not? Yeah, no, here it is. Uh, uh, yeah, Mir. ambush. Mir. Yep. I knew there was one. <laughs> That's, I was like trying to use one of them as an example. All right, so let's say Mir has uh, uh, ambushed Juliet. Well, Mir applies the uh, the curse effect to Juliet, like we talked about last week. But let's say Tamram's turns next. He can do Sacred Flame. He makes his attack. He can remove. Uh, that curse effect from his ally Juliet before she makes her attack so if you get the option um, you know obviously in PvP you're kind of a little more uh, you're tied into the spot that you uh, make your actions in so it might be a little more important to you know, know when you're doing these different abilities but for PvE you know it can be good to uh, to, to, to plan um, when you're going to uh, use your heroes at different times. But anyway, so you can remove that curse effect from uh, Juliet in this case, which would be great because curse is really, really, you know, uh, challenging uh, condition that essentially, you know, you're, you're going to roll tight twice and you're going to have to get the worst result. And uh, that can be uh, pretty devastating uh, because I've seen quite a few times where you end up missing and you have to take that miss. Um, especially if you got like a good good hit or even if you got like a crit, you're going to be really killing yourself then. <laughs> All right. So the uh, so that, that part's uh, pretty good. You know, it's get, clearing up some debuffs, doing some uh, cleansing basically. And then the second effect, which is really the best part because Tamram has the strongest heal... And that is this ability. So it is you or an ally within range may regain uh, uh, eight hit points. Eight hit points is a lot of hit points in this game. Um, so the reason why I talked about the attack timeline before was oftentimes when people play this, they will read the, the card and do like Sacred Flame and go you know top to bottom, which is right. But they're supposed to do the passive first. So often what will happen is, let's say, you know, this person wants to really heal Juliet, say she's really low. They're going to apply that eight hit points and then they would, you know, automatically without thinking, go, oh, well, I'm going to throw in hope and make that a 12. Well, you can't do that. You, you can't you can't apply both because eight is essentially, you know, like the highest you can you can get. Um I don't, uh, you might be actually get a little bit more with Divine Grace, but um, it's still, it's, uh, 
it's you know that's a lot of hit points and they're trying to make it so that way you essentially can't just take tank whole hits uh with with healers healers are supposed to provide some healing to mitigate damage uh but they're not necessarily you know just eating through all attacks and hits and uh making people impervious from dying so all right so moving on to sanctuary uh his other main primary attack it's uh ranged eight one enemy 10 damage so it's higher damage but not you know anything real crazy an ally within range is toughened go down here to toughen toughen is minus three damage when hit by an enemy attack so in that case we talked about earlier say uh julia is toughened because uh tamram has applied sanctuary to her and Cedric attacks. Uh, he he will do an attack that uh, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's say he's gonna he's gonna do Moonlight Rage, uh, and he's not getting his his passive uh, that or his uh, yeah any of it. Well, you could say his passive, I guess. So um, he would normally be doing 15 damage, right? Well, now you're gonna turn that one into uh, uh, 12 which is still you know a pretty devastating hit 12 is pretty pretty good hit but uh, it makes it more manageable to uh, kind of keep going so it help help tank uh, things down a little bit and then it makes you immune to new effects from enemies except passive powers so basically the heroes kind of have a, a little bit of way around that it's a pretty common theme throughout uh, all the heroes in the game that passive powers are often not um, uh, they're not restricted by a lot of the rules like uh, other abilities are so uh, making you a new uh, immune to new effects from enemies such as you know um, you know not being able to apply cursed or exposed or slowed or vulnerable or anything you know weakened or anything so that will really uh, really help your team not get beaten down, really. So it really busts up your defensive potential, which is definitely one of the main reasons here that Dragori has uh, made the defensive stat really high for Tamrum. Um, obviously, along with cleansing, cleansing uh, uh, temporary effects from Sacred Flame. All right, now we're going to go to Miracle, which is an interrupt. I believe, uh, do we cover an interrupt yet? To, uh, I don't think we have. I think we have covered interrupts yet. None of the... Uh... Nobody else Nobody else had an interrupt. All right, so this is going to be a good time. And I, I was actually planning to essentially go over interrupts here soon. So I'm glad I have the attack timeline out. So Perfect. basically what happens with uh, an interrupt is and let's see it says yeah right here so it's at the very top this declaration of attack so what's going to happen is let's say um we're going to go back to cedric because he's uh he's literally a, a beast doggo as uh <laughs> beast doggo yeah beast doggo um that could do a ton of damage. So let's say he's going to use Bloodthirsty. 24 damage hit. Obviously, he's going to get up higher uh, with his passive and you know potentially other things So and get that permanent on. Well, what Cedric can do, and this is true for, or I'm sorry, Tamram, uh, what other heroes can do as well is these abilities called interrupts. So you can tell that it's an interrupt specifically because there's a uh, hand right next to the ability that hand means designates it as an interrupt so it's a range eight and i think i think all the interrupts are ranged attacks i don't think there is uh any melee uh interrupts and there's kind of a reason to that if you if you had a melee uh interrupt it would make it much more difficult to use an interrupt than it would for a ranged attack so what's going to happen is uh uh let's say Cedric is like, I'm going to use Bloodthirsty on uh, Juliet. Well, if you have your special token up and you are really wanting to prevent that massive damage to Juliet, you want to try saving her, you can go, okay, well, I'm going to interrupt. You just you just call it out during that other person's turn. and that, So you're supposed to do it early on. You can't wait till after they roll. 
because after you roll they've already essentially made the attack so you're going to call it before basically they're gonna say okay I'm gonna do bloodthirsty on uh, Juliet and then that's when you say interrupt so in this case you take a drawback of 10 damage so Tamram suffers 10 damage it can't kill him and this is true for pretty much all the interrupts they, they won't kill you so even if you're at one hit point you use an interrupt you won't die he doesn't do any damage to Cedric and then the effect is that the, the targets uh, attack is negated so that bloodthirsty is now does nothing and then you or an ally within range regains eight hit points so then you'll get to trigger hope as well if you make this so with an interrupt you got to roll the dice just like any other ability so you roll the dice against that target so Cedric uh, he's got only uh, six defense I rolled a 17 that means I get to use miracle so I you know run through the effects like we did before um, the drawback technically uh, just for clarification too, a drawback happens before a roll so if I said interrupt you know I'm using miracle I would take 10 damage and then I'd roll and let's say I you know missed my attack instead of actually making it I would still take that 10 damage and then I wouldn't get to do the damage or the effect so it's an important thing to know as well so in this case this interrupt is not it's not great it's not a great interrupt there's way better ones but Tamram is a very strong hero with being able to you know his strong heals and being able to debuff so just being able to negate attack and do you know another eight hit point health uh, you know increase is uh, is still pretty decent but it's not it's not great or anything it's not applying any permanent effects or anything alright so I think that covers uh, interrupts and specifically miracle and then we're gonna move on to divine grace his other special attack it is an eight range one ally and zero damage the target regains 25 hit points so that is huge not the strongest he direct heal but it is still very <coughs> strong what's even better is this permanent he chooses an ally within range it doesn't have to be the person that you targeted it could be somebody else and they regain four hit points whenever it declares attack on its turn up to once per turn so let's say Tamram heals uh, Juliet and she uh, so we're gonna say Juliet did not receive uh, hope in this case someone else received hope um, or uh, Tamram personally cannot receive uh, hope as well because he cannot be an ally of himself uh, he can give it to other people but he can't give it to himself so it'd have to be a different team member than Juliet but anyway let's say he he heals you know uh, he could heal Juliet he heals Juliet and he decides to put this permanent effect on her um, for this case and then you know another enemy team member goes say Mir and then we go back to Juliet it's gonna be Juliet's turn well when she makes her attack because uh, it, it says specifically you declare declare an attack so you don't even have to hit it all you have to do is say in Juliet's case which will you know we'll get to this here or later is she's gonna let's say she's like I'm gonna do icy wind on Cedric that's it uh, she gains the, uh, the four hit points additional so if she got healed from um, uh, the divine grace she's got 29 hit points back in her pocket which uh, which is you know essentially that yeah I mean that is almost exactly half of her health or uh, well, actually I'm sorry uh, of a healer's health but for a shooter it's actually more than half their health but anyway, so it's a, it's a massive heal, and that, that permanent is so good because you're going to be able to essentially keep somebody healed up even if you're not healing them. They're just going to keep getting it every time they make their attack, so it's a fantastic permanent. All right, so that is uh, Tamram. What do you uh, think about Tamram there, Codeman? 
So, Tamrum, I think, is pretty good. Don't bring him to a boss fight, like, with the dragon, because the uh, interrupts don't work too well with them. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's so, very true. I don't know if you want to touch on that. In a little yeah, bit, but... no, that's a good point. So, um, one of the things about interrupts is you can make interrupts. It's not that you can't make them against bosses, but the... Um, overlord abilities which all bosses have state that essentially the attacks by the bosses cannot be modified so in this case for miracle if the the boss is making some strong attack that does 20 damage to you know let's say all your heroes or something like that you cannot negate that attack with miracle so you know in you know for this case it'd be pretty i mean it'd be better just to use sacred flame than it would be to use miracle in this case unless you really needed to try to get that eight hit points onto somebody else and not tamram but um yeah so that, that is an important point to to make sure that you know for uh interrupts but tamram in general i i like tamram he's pretty good in both pvp and pve oh yeah just definitely. not against just not against a boss. Um, but other than that, um, Divine Grace, you know, 25 health is crazy amount. Yeah. Um, like you were mentioning before, e HP is a lot, so 25 is like an enormous amount, and then having it add into permanent on top of that is just really good. Oh yeah, um, that's huge. But definitely one thing, especially for beginners, um, is definitely get familiar with the attack timeline, especially when it comes to hope. Oh, um, yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've messed that up on our stream, um, where I'm like, oh, I want to give this guy four health. Oh, wait, I don't have anyone else to give the normal eight health to after. Yep. So, yep, um, that does happen a lot. But hope is optional, right? If yep. I am correct. You don't have so, to apply it. So if you get in a situation where you'd rather have the eight because you can't give both four and eight, you can skip hope. But you want to make sure you always put your healers in a position where you can maximize the amount of health you're giving everyone. Yeah. So, um, well, and actually I wanted to make a clarification too because this was something that was uh, actually argued about in one of our previous streams. But uh, I did get clarification on Alex was that the part where it says uh, it can't regain HP again this turn is specifically means to Tamram's turn. So there is other characters that can heal. For example, Sir Eric, he has um, Holy Sword where he can apply three hit points to another ally that's within five squares. So let's say um, in our case uh, earlier, Juliet receives hope and you know it says that she can't get it so she can't get sacred flame right uh the heal mm -hmm. from that it's going to go on somebody else well when it gets to sir eric's turn let's say he's you know the next person to go he can use holy sword to additionally heal julia even though she has received uh hope previously it doesn't prevent her from uh from her getting it from sir eric so there was there was a thought that was different than that th the thought uh, essentially nobody else could get a heal if they were uh, in the same round or, or all the heroes together, but that's not the case. All right, yep, but uh, yeah, going along, Tamram definitely pretty easy, especially with those really strong direct heals. Um, it does make him a lot easier applying an extremely strong passive effect. Um, and then, you know, having those interrupts to be able to apply and defensive abilities does make Tamrum a very good ability. And I, I would say I pretty much agree, I think. I, maybe his defense could be one little lower, but I, I do see, you know, essentially the they're trying to attribute, I think, a lot of the healing towards defensive. So I think we're going to see a lot of this where defense is going to be really high just because they're counting that healing as defense. But uh, he does have abilities that, that apply that as well. So Anyway, that's Tamram. So now we're going to move on to 
Talia, the druid. So, Talia is powerful healer with the rare ability to revive an ally. Her greatest power is to prevent damage before it happens. Ideals and strategies based on a single hero that must stay alive at any cost. Attacks, yeah, and then we'll get into the attacks. All right, so her defense is slightly higher. Her defense is even higher than Tamram's, which we'll talk about why that is, or most likely why that is. Mobility is the same. Uh, the effects is slightly lower, and the handling is slightly lower. Uh, let's see, so there's a question of... Uh, so Tamram can't heal the same person twice in his turn. Yes, that is correct. Essentially, you cannot apply Hope and Sacred Flame um, in the same turn. You can, uh, let's say, you apply Sacred Flame to a different character, and then Juliet receives Hope, and then on Juliet's turn, she can, if she already had Divine Grace, she can get the the healing from her permanent effect, but she uh, wouldn't be able to receive Sacred Flame and Hope or you know, let's say miracle and hope or something. So, all right, back to Talia. So, uh, uh, anyway, she is definitely one of the str maybe strongest characters uh, in the game, and because she has some some really great abilities, but there there is there is trade offs to it. So it's not like she's you know greatly overpowered or anything. So starting with her primary attacks, Nymph's Kiss. Uh, range 8, 1 enemy, 6 damage, which is very low, like we talked about earlier. You are an ally within uh, range, regain 7 hit points, so you'll notice that's 1 hit point less than Tamram, but 7 is still very strong. But what's even better is an ally within range is blessed and hastened. Uh, for people that don't know, blessed means you get to roll twice and you get the best result. So on your primary attacks only. Uh, and then hastened means you do not incite reaction attacks. So you can move around the board without actually uh, suffering any reaction attacks. Which is, it's, the second part of the effect is really, really good. Um, being blessed and being able to get that freedom to move is really strong for uh, this ability. Uh, especially because it doesn't even have to apply to that same person. It can apply to anybody else. Um, obviously, it can't apply to Talia, but it can apply to anybody else. So it's a fantastic uh, ability there. Really good for, um, I mean, fantastic for any ranged characters because ranged characters can get pinned down very easily. So it's good for them. But I mean, just as easily, you know, great for uh, uh, any of the the melee characters as well. Um, I was trying to think who, especially like, I mean, uh, Reckless Blow, great uh, uh, combination with because uh, you'll essentially increase your chance potentially to get that uh, plus 10 damage instead of plus 5 for crits. Um, anyway, so being blessed is fantastic and uh, getting that movement is great. All right, then Shield of Flowers. Range 8, 1 enemy, 10 damage, so the same as uh, Sanctuary from Tamram. And then the effect is an ally within range is immune to damage from the next primary attack that hits it. So this is, this is easily one of the best defensive moves in the game, and that's because it essentially negates an entire attack. So that means you have to have either a special attack to make against an enemy, or you have to use a basic attack. Uh, so in PvE, most enemies have, are going to use their primary attack. Their basic attack is weaker, um, and it varies, you know, character to character, which one's actually better. But I mean, it's, it's still very strong. It's it's really better for PvP slightly because the heroes do have better primary attacks than uh, uh, the other characters do. But uh, or you know, um, the non-playable characters in the campaign do, but Still, it's fantastic, and and you can set up some great strategies and synergies about around placing that on uh, one of your allies. Um, you can essentially force them to attack like a different ally. Let's say, uh, you know, Juliet's out here, or whatever, and she's uh, she's got Cedric on top of her, 
and um, we got Julia or Talia way way out here, and she's applying this, and um, Cedric doesn't have his special up. He he could he could still make his his basic attack, but still, I mean, preventing you know that additional damage from from coming in. Uh, would be really good, and you know, Juliet will uh, uh, be able to potentially survive his his attack when he's only going to get eight damage. When we all know Cedric, you know, potentially could do up to fifteen or even higher. So, uh, depending on his life points, so it's a uh, it's really good move to uh, to have, and you could force, you know, maybe uh, instead he's going to be forced to attack Sir Eric or something instead because uh, Juliet just isn't you know a good enough target so then he's gonna go after the tank or somebody else you you don't want him to uh, or you, you don't mind if he attacks them instead all right fantastic ability um, like I said it's only primary attacks so you got to keep that in mind all right going to her special spring seeds this is that uh, resurrection ability that is very strong it's and you know th this can always be uh, you know debated. In my opinion, it's not the best resurrection in the game. I'll uh, once we get to controllers, I'll uh, tell you who that is. But uh, Spring Seeds, range eight, one ally. And oh, you know what? This is actually a great point to talk about. This is an item that has come up a couple times. So let's say Juliet is gonna. Ne she needs uh, healing from Spring Seeds. Well. This often confuses players because they're not really sure like what what you're rolling against. Well, you're rolling against the same defense of uh, of which whatever your target is. So in this case, Juliet is the ally of Talia, and her defense is six. So you would have to roll a six or better for Juliet. So keep that in mind because tanks they all have a defense of eight. And people say, well, gee, shouldn't it be harder to to heal the um, or easier to heal a tank than you know say other characters? Well, there's there's uh, actually a whole uh, BGG post about this subject, and Alex goes into the statistical chances of hitting characters and and why there's a reasoning uh, behind making tanks harder to heal. Um, and so I'm sure you could uh, go go find that if you're really wanting to dig down deep into it. But basically, your tanks are going to be able to absorb quite a bit of damage. Um, and if they are able to absorb a significant amount of damage and be able to receive, you know, maybe even more healing than other characters, if they had less of a chance to, uh, you know, like you had a better chance of healing them, then they it would make them significantly um, stronger uh, than uh, uh, some of the other characters, uh, at least you know in combination with healers. So anyway, so we're gonna jump back into spring seeds here. So it's a zero damage because obviously you're healing in allies. The the effect is the target regains 32 hit points, which is you know massive, um, or you and the target regain 18 hit points each so you can you know you can choose to split it up give yourself a little bit of healing give uh give juliet a little bit of healing, or just give juliet a massive heal and then you may remove one permanent effect from a combatant within range uh, so that part's really strong um so earlier we talked about let's say uh cedric right he had bloodthirsty um, or he, he could potentially get bloodthirsty where he gets uh, crits on his 17s or higher. You can essentially remove that by uh, uh, using Juliet's Spring Seeds. So this doesn't always apply, but sometimes it is, especially if you have a lot of different heroes that are applying permanent effects in there. Uh, it's uh, good to at least get one of those ones off on an uh, enemy. Um, also, you could essentially remove one that's like a negative uh, permanent effect, such as, um, let's see, like uh, Nightmare, for example, is like a permanent weaken on an enemy. So you could remove that. 
um, from whoever uh, the target is. So let's say Juliet received Nightmare, you could remove that, and that uh, really help benefit her damage. All right, and one thing to note about uh, this Spring Seeds is that the target, uh, even if you miss the attack, you're still going to get healing. That that target's still going to get healing, uh, but they're not, you know, it's not going like they're going to miss out on the whole thing. They just, you know, don't get all the effects or all the strength of, of that heal. So it still can be pretty beneficial, similar to like, um, other special attacks, if you miss those, which they're not even actually written on uh, most of the cards here, or the uh, hero pads, but written on the cards, it says if you miss a special attack, like an attack damage one, uh, that target will take 15 residual, uh, but for healing, it's 15 healing residual, so that's very good. Still, still giving you a chance, even if you miss. All right. Breath of Life is uh, range 8, one dead ally. Um, so you have, uh, you know what, I think I mentioned earlier about confusing uh, one of the resurrections. This, the last one was a healing ability, this one's the resurrection. So this one you get to revive the target, place it within 5 squares of you with 35 hit points, which is a lot, uh, but no special attack. So if Juliet dies um, and she's, you know, let's say she's 8 out here. I could place her all the way back um, here, for example, one, two, three, four, five, and so she's way out of uh, potentially getting uh, attacked again. She won't have her specials, as one, is one thing to keep in mind. If your character dies in uh, uh, PvP or PvE and is resurrected, they have no specials unless a card that resurrects you uh, gives you some specials back you normally don't get them so you got to keep that in mind sometimes it's better to just make that special if you know you're about to die than uh, trying to hold on to it because you'll end up losing it uh, so 35 hit points is a very significant amount to come with, back with the standard for first aid I believe is I think it's 10 hit points I mean I know we don't really talk a lot about first aid but it's you know it's like I think it's like 10 or 20 hit points. It's it's not too much. And then we have um, uh, some other healers that do like 25 hit points, which is much lower. So uh, still still very decent ability being able to get an ally back, uh, another person to throw turns, especially in PVE, is uh, very good to have. All right. And then we're going to move on to, oh, wait, hold on. Let's uh, cover this. So offense, um, I'm not really sure. You know, there's not there's not really a reason as to why her offense should be higher. I guess the only thing that could be potentially argued is, uh, you know, you're being able to remove a permanent effect or, um, the fact that you're you make an ally blessed, but you're not actually doing direct damage, so it could be argued either way uh, on offense. Defense, shield the flowers is fantastic ability, negating somebody's uh, whole attack if they try to make it, um, or you know having those strong heals through nymph's kiss and uh, spring seeds are very good. And then, of course, you know, bringing somebody back. So you have a, just all around, if we're counting healing as defensive, uh, then, yeah, she's very defensive character. Uh, and then mobility, she doesn't really have anything for mobility. Effects, the only thing she's got is the, the Blessed Hastened and then the Shield of Flowers, but the others are just direct um, healing. Obviously, you can remove that effect, but... So that plays into some, but maybe not as much as I guess they were thinking where all four abilities do. So it's a little bit lower. Handling. The reason I'd say handling is a little bit lower is specifically probably because of Shield of Flowers. Being able to put that on the right person at the right time is uh, fundamental in being able to utilize that ability appropriately. Because it can be very easy for somebody just, you know, like we're, we're talking about earlier with Juliet, right? Um, standing over here, well, oh, she's going to attack Sir Eric, then maybe it's not that big of a deal that you put uh, Shield of Flowers on. So, 
Anyway, so uh, still relatively pretty easy. You know, most of the healers are going to be a little bit on the easier side. I think the next guy we got is probably the, the harder one, but they're not too bad. So what do you think about Talia there, uh, Code? Talia is actually, I think, my favorite healer um, in the game so far. Obviously, down the road, if there's more healers, that might change. But definitely... Definitely a good overall character. I love Shield of Flowers, the ability to, you know, negate damage from primary attacks on a character is awesome. Um Diff's Kiss is pretty broken. I mean, yes, it's one HP less than Tamram's um Sacred Flame, but the ability to have Bless and Hasten on an ally is Pretty crazy. And it doesn't even have to be the same person you're putting a no. heal on, which is just so crazy. Yeah, so one person can get the bless, the other one can get the hasten, so it, yeah. it's pretty crazy. Um, Spring Seeds is very good. I mean, you can heal her for 16 and someone else for 16, or really 18. boost them. Is it 18? I thought yeah, it was 16. 18. Oh, 18. That's even better. <laughs> Uh, 18. Yeah, I which... mean, one, one thing to keep in mind, right, is obviously if, if you regain 18 and someone else regains 18, you got 36 just from yeah. that effect instead of the direct heal of 32. So you actually get more healing if you decide to split it up. So if, you know, someone's not in critical shape, going 18-18 might be even better in some situations versus just the full 32. Yep. Um, I mean, she's overall a really good character, and I mean, even if you miss on her specials, you're still gaining well, 15 and, HP. Yeah, I mean, then even still, even if you're splitting it up, too, you uh, you get that passive hope. If you got another guy you can heal in there, you got 40 health <laughs> in a single yeah. ability. It's just, you know, we talked about uh, damage dealers earlier. There's not many characters that can go into the 40 range for a single damage hit, so... Being able to nah. heal back for it is really strong. Nah, I think she's a very excellent healer. Um, some people say she's probably the best healer in the game. You know, it's up for debate, I think, a little bit, but she's definitely a very useful character and a good healer. Yeah. She's got a little more versatility um, than... Uh, well, I there's one more character that's a little more versatile, but strong heals with some versatility. So. All right. Uh, also, so I'd like to note one little thing. So one uh, item from the original Kickstarter was there was an alternate uh, art that was uh, as, essentially like a Kickstarter goal from the first campaign. Well, they actually applied this one. I'm not, I am really don't know. I don't think they mentioned anything about this yet for the, the new campaign for anybody receiving the core box. I'm assuming people will still get this alternate art that existed for uh, the first Kickstarter backers. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they could, they could change it. It is a, a whole extra one. Th this is a very common question too, that when people started receiving their boxes, they're like, wait, why did I get a second one? Well, it's because they did a, you know, the stretch goal for it of an alternate art art and the community voted for Talia and, you know, whether you agree with it or not, there's uh, some people that are not always happy with the uh, choices of art for some of the women characters uh, in this game. And uh, Talia especially is a, a bit much <laughs> in her original art. Um, and so this, this other one is still a cool one without... Uh, getting too sexualized with the character, so I think it was a good compromise. All right, so now we will move on to Ustar, the Necromancer. So he is a healer who deals good damage and applies debuffs. He gets stronger every time a combatant dies, being ideal in the end game for teams that protected and buff him. Uh, so that is definitely very much true. If Ustar can last towards the end of a battle, he is going to be doing a lot more damage and applying more effects than uh, than other healers. So, um, 
it is uh, uh, a, a great character. He's definitely the most offensive, which I do agree with here. Defensive, slightly lower than Talia, um, but same as Tamrum. Uh, we'll kind of get into that. Mobility slightly higher. Uh, effects is, um, I think, about the same as Talia. And so it's still very high. And then handling is a little bit lower than Talia. He, he, he can be a little more challenging, but not, not too difficult. He's not too bad. But you just got to remember to apply all the different effects for him. So... Alright, so going into Ustar here for his primary attacks, we got Life Siphon, range 8, 1 enemy, 6 damage uh, on his hit, so same as uh, the other guys. And then uh, the target is cursed, which is, you know, very good condition. And then you are an ally within range, regains 6 hit points. So 6 slightly lower than Tam, uh, 2 lower from Tamrim, 1 lower from Talia, so he's a little bit weak, uh, weaker on the heals. Uh, but then his third effect is that the target will take plus 1 damage for each dead combatant up to 4, da 4 plus damage. So essentially you can turn Life Siphon into 10 damage consistently when you have uh, more dead combatants. So, you know, keyword being combatant, which means it doesn't necessarily have to apply just to your uh, team, but also the enemy team as well, whether it's PvE or PvP. So, uh, being able to do that 10 damage and 6 healing, I mean, it could be argued essentially you're doing about 16 damage uh, right there, 20 with hope. So, uh, you know, equivalent if you were to compare Ustar to a damage, but obviously it's, it's not actually damage, it's healing. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's really good uh, being able to get that extra damage. Um, you know, and then of course, Cursed being able to throw in there. All, all around, it's a, it's a great, great ability, um, but you got to make sure to really remember the, the damage part. All right, and then we got uh, Death Ray, range eight, one enemy, gain a bonus to two to your roll, so you get a better chance to hit, which is uh, which is really good. Uh, target is vulnerable. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, ten damage, missed that part. Ten damage, and the effect is that the target is vulnerable. So vulnerable is uh, the plus three damage when hit by an enemy attack. So uh, you could potentially add, a, you know, plus three damage in there from uh, for somebody else to, to make and make your, your attacks a little bit stronger. Uh, and then remove from an enemy within range all temporary effects applied by your enemies. So this is kind of, you know, a little bit opposite, I guess, of uh, Tamram, where he removed from his allies, uh, all temporary effect effects applied by enemies. Well, Ustar is doing essentially the opposite. Remove from an enemy within range all temporary effects applied by your enemies. So, um, you know, a, a case for that would be, uh, I think Sir, no, not Sir Eric. I was trying to see, there's someone else here that applies uh, I thought there was someone else here that can apply a toughen to somebody else or protect it to somebody else. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm missing missing it here. But um, anyway, so you let's say that somebody else gets uh, blessed uh, from um, like I think you know like Talia for example she applies blessed. Well, let's say Ustar obviously is on the other team and uh, he can remove that from a different character. So, you know, if it's Cedric, for example, that was blessed and hastened, he could you use death ray and remove that blessed and hastened if he was the next person. So, you know, being able to time those at the right time is, uh, you know, using these abilities at the right time is really important, especially if... You know, Talia makes her move, then Ustar is going to go next. Really take advantage of using that death ray before Cedric would get that bonus to use Blessed and Hastened. 
Um, so it's you know it's a decent ability. Uh, get you know getting that additional benefit to your rolls. Uh, never say no to that. It's uh, you're always gonna really love that because um, you, know, you just never know if you'll get really close. You know even if it's like six six defense and you roll a four, you'd be like yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know code has run into that many many a time. Almost every. Uh time you play i think <laughs> yeah all right and then we got the uh vengeful wraith it is 22 damage you may move yourself up to five squares and then make a dead combatant's primary attack as if it was yours all right so this is one of the more interesting abilities so 22 damage is uh it's it's a pretty strong attack especially for a healer and then you may move up to five squares so you could Ustar, let's say, let's see, I'm gotta grab his uh his thing here. Ustar, he can he's like way out here, away from the battlefield, trying not to get effect, but he's gonna go in there and he's gonna go one, two, three, and then four, and he's gonna let's say uh um I don't know the barbarian's dead or something like that um uh. Uh, Katar the Barbarian is dead and, and Ustar is going to use a primary attack well he could use um, let's say Mighty Blow or Berserker Strike or something he can use that uh, if Katar has already died against say Cedric or something um, on his turn which would be a great obviously you're not you're not going to benefit from the Brute pa Passive you'll still get your passive on um your first attack there so vengeful wraith will do the damage you'll get that you'll get hope at the beginning for that one uh but you're gonna have to roll again to make the primary attack so you gotta actually roll twice for that ability so keep that in mind um great great ability to to utilize you know anybody it doesn't even have to be an enemy it could be a ally and use that against them uh, but what's even better is going to be this next one. So uh, range 8, harvest the soul, range 8, enemy 1, 16 damage. So much lower on the damage end for a uh, special attack. You are an ally within range, regain 16 hit points. So you get, you get some healing there, kind of like the other guys, but obviously significantly lower. But you gain the sweet permanent. You may spend your prime action to make any of your dead allies' primary attacks. So what that means is your prime action is uh, essentially movement or attacks. Um, in this case, they're specifically referring to attacks. So let's say uh, Juliet was on your team, but she was killed off earlier in the battle. Um, well, you can start laying out some damage as if you were Juliet. You can uh, use Icy Wind or Winter's Breath and uh, you, know, you get to choose every turn which, which one you want to use. It's only primary attacks, um, but you get to use those, which is really good because you can essentially turn into a damage dealer. Let's say you're gonna use, um, uh, I don't know, like Cedric, for example. Uh, Moonlight Rage. Let's say let's say you're uh, taking Cedric, who's already died, and you're using his ability. And and obviously Cedric in this example is on uh, Ustar's team. Uh, he dies. Well, Ustar can use Moonlight Rage against one of his uh, other enemies. Obviously, he has to get in uh, melee to use it. Uh, but he can get the sweet benefits of it too. So he can do that 11 damage, make a target exposed, and then if he did have low health, he can get that benefit of doing 18 damage. So 18 damage for a healer, I mean, that's it's freaking massive. So the offensive potential of Ustar is only limited by your team. So if you pick a very you know highly damaged uh, high high damage team to go with you into battle, Ustar could easily be you know significantly higher. Now obviously it's at the cost of your own team because as your team dies, 
you know you don't have them anymore and you're relying more on him to do it so there obviously there's the big downside of that they actually have to be dead for it so and the reason why i bring this up is because in so in pvp it's this ability is pretty good in pve this ability lacks a little bit and that's only because most of the time you're really trying to focus on not getting your allies killed uh, if possible um, you're trying to avoid any of your characters dying as much as possible because that's one less turn to be doing damage or healing or what it, whatever you're gonna, you know need to do with that character um, but you know so that that benefit is kind of taken away a little bit um, it's still there, obviously, but it, it in my opinion, it kind of goes against a little bit what I usually try to do, which is keep all of my team alive. <laughs> so anyway, definitely awesome abilities. Um, you know, can do a ton of damage if you give them the right team. What do you think uh, about Ustar there, Code? So Ustar, I really like him in PvP. Because uh, a lot of times in PvE, like you just mentioned, we're not trying to get your allies to die. Um, PvP, obviously, that's going to happen more. You, well, you hope your characters don't die, but it's more likely they're going to die in PvE yeah. than PvE. And, and it's it's one of those things that, like, you know, you try to, to negate that as much as possible for, for P, PvP. Uh, but you know you're l much less likely for that to actually you know that your your plan for that to really work right there's a very good chance that your allies are g going to die in pvp being able to have all four of your heroes survive in pvp is uh can be really challenging so but the one game mode that i think he's going to be semi decent and semi bad in but it'd be interesting choices, boss versus boss, because your character is going to be dying left and right. Uh, that is a good uh, point there. Uh, I haven't really thought too much about that, but that is a good point because um, you're so. I guess it depends on your timing of it too, because right. in boss versus boss, your character is only going to be dead for essentially one turn. So you'd only get, you'd have to like time it as one of your characters dies and then Ustar uses that ability when he needs to at the right opportunity uh, before that character comes back because then that person's not dead anymore. Correct. So I think timing on him, that would make him very hard to use, I think. But I think in certain situations, that Harvest Souls permanent might be, you know, game breaking especially if you're taking an ability like moonlight range or yeah. something dealing a lot of damage so yeah he might be yeah um yeah so he he definitely can be a little more challenging i mean I, I really like life siphon because it doesn't apply specifically to only um you know your allies uh, because of, uh, you know, the fact that even if, you know, enemies are dying, once you have four enemies dead, you're going to be getting that plus 10, you know, you're getting that 10 damage to the plus four each time, um, which is really good. Obviously, it's a little more challenging with the Harvest of Souls because it's only for your allies. Um, right. And then um, uh, same, same thing with Vengeful Wraith. So it's, 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 you know, Life Siphon, or uh, Vengeful Wraith is kind of like the Harvest of Souls ability, but, um, you know, a better version of it. But uh, you only get to do it that one time, which is uh, a little disappointing. You got to make right. sure to, to utilize that at the best time possible. But other than that, I think he's interesting. He's definitely good in PvP. And, um... Yeah, who starts great and and check out this model i mean it's I'm bad really ass. excited <laughs> for this model um you guys probably saw earlier on the webcam you know the webcam uh, the you know the original version is he's got his uh his scythe and he's holding a single you know skeleton and this one he's got like 
you know, skeletons climbing out of the gra grave, and there's like a whole like flame thing coming up with skulls in it, and you know, his, his armor and everything looks way better, um, and, and his scythe does too. So, really excited to to see that guy in real life. Uh, he's gonna be freaking awesome. I, I didn't even cover some of the others like Talia. Now she's gonna also have like a freaking hawk. <laughs> you're gonna have a hawk, not not just the snake, which is significantly improved, but also this hawk uh, coming down and and hanging out with her while she does some healing and you know uh, hanging out in the uh, the the forest. And then Tamram, which I mentioned earlier, is it's basically the exact same model, just with way more detail. So it's good, but not not crazy improvement. Ustar is way better. Uh, improvement. One thing that actually d did disappoint me a little bit about Ustar, and I understand that the game, you know, maybe a little bit different, but so in my mind, when I think of a necromancer, I think of a person that is bringing like enemies back from the dead to life. And <clears throat> Ustar doesn't actually do that. All he does is he, you know, inhibits. This, their spirits it's like he he you know conjures up their spirits and and uses you know like himself as a as a conduit for their their uh, attacks um but yeah he doesn't actually bring anybody I mean, it's not like you're getting you know skeleton minions on the board or anything i think that'd be freaking awesome if he had like some additional ability that gave him something like that or i don't know maybe you know, I don't know. I just always felt like it's like it doesn't really feel like a traditional necromancer, in my opinion. No, I can see where you're coming from. I, I agree with that. I mean, he's more of a spirit channeler. Like, yeah, than he is like a necromancer. But yeah, in fact, uh, one of the um, you know, I made a custom hero, and I think I named that character the Invoker, and it's basically the same idea of this. This character is, you know, summoning these, uh, or channeling these spirit spirits to mm -hmm. their will, and they're, you know, making these attacks as if they're these these other spirits and everything. And I feel that's really more of what he is than a necromancer, but you know, everyone has their own opinion, right? Yeah. But Ustar. Ustar. Fun 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 uh hero definitely. He's not, you know, not like Tamram or Talia where they're definitely more just about doing healing and reducing damage, but not really doing any damage themselves or doing anything kinda crazy, so he's uh he's a fun one to play with. Okay. So we are an hour and eight minutes in. We're going to move on to Jade the Bard. She is the last healer we're going to go over tonight. Uh, well, actually, the last healer of the class, but also <laughs> the last <laughs> one we're doing. <laughs> I mean, there's no more. <laughs> All right. So very versatile and strategic healer. She is vital in many combos because she can reposition all of her allies and apply buffs according to the team's needs. Ideal in complex and varied strategies. Uh, I very much agree with those uh, statements that they use because once you see the abilities that Jade has, uh, you're going to go, holy crap, she's got some freaking crazy, crazy uh, abilities that will influence her entire team. And, uh, uh, you know, being able to utilize them at the right time is uh, even more important than any of the other characters that we've talked about so far. So, offense lower uh, two, which uh, we'll, we'll probably. T uh, I guess she is a little bit more damage heavy. We'll we'll talk about that. Defense uh, same as Talia. Uh, mobility much higher. This is actually a very important point for Jade. Uh, and then effects, very high on effects. We'll talk about that. And handling, definitely the uh, hardest hero. Um, you know, I'd say to play Jade really well, uh, yes, the handling is a lot lower. I'd say two or three or something. I think beginner players could 
potentially play her, you know, still relatively pretty easy, and it won't be the end of the world, but, you know, positioning is key in this game, so I can see why they think that, you know, her handling is so low, because position, is, uh, the movement she gets to apply and everything will be uh, very important to her team, so... I going into primary attacks, angelic voice, eight range, one enemy, seven damage, so slightly higher damage than uh, all the other previous healers uh, for this ability. Uh, and then the effect is you are an ally within range, regain six hit points, so lower than Talia, lower than Tamron, but same as uh, Ustar. And then a second effect is an ally within range is hastened and its primary attack strikes are critical hits on rolls of 17 and more. That is incredibly strong effect. Um, we purposely have, so best combination that I always think of with Jade and Angelic Voice is her and uh, uh, Merlot the Minotaur doing Reckless Blow because he does increase damage on his critical hits. So if you team up uh, Angelic Voice on Merlot and he gets, uh, you know, on he doesn't have to roll 20. He can roll 17, 18, 19, 20. He'll get that 10 plus damage, which will put, put him at 30 damage. <laughs> All right, counting, counting his passive, uh, 30 damage on a primary attack is just, you know, freaking in, insane. Obviously, he's getting crit, so, you know, uh, other people could potentially have high hits as well, but, you know, it's a great combination because he's getting that bonus to his crits and uh, Jade's making it easier for him to crit. And he's hastened, so he gets to move around the battlefield a lot easier. So, uh, and then of course, remember, this is only for primary attacks, it's not for special attacks, but uh, still very, very strong uh, effect, uh, especially, you know, you want to place this on people that are getting blessed. People that are blessed uh, will have much better chance to get this trigger of getting their crits, so, um, you know, standing on altar is a great option, or, uh, or somebody that already has an effect for it. All right, you know, slightly higher damage on that one too, which is, uh, you know, not bad. Uh, and then we got Heroic Mel Melody, range eight, one enemy, 10 damage, so the same as all the other guys. An ally within range is empowered, ends if used, so empowered is plus three damage when your attack hits an enemy. So she gives this to somebody else, say, She's going to give it to Cedric. On his attack, he's going to do plus three damage uh, to uh, an enemy. So make make your, uh, your allies even stronger. Then the second part is, and this is really the best. Oh, this part is just so good. It's so good. I love this character. I think she... <laughs> Ah, it's so it's so tough. I, lo I love all the healers. They're so good in so many ways, but she is so versatile. And she can be used so many different ways. So the second effect, you may move any number of allies within range up to two squares each. That is fantastic. Being able to move people. And because she is moving people, uh, none of those allies will incite reaction attacks. That's freaking fantastic so we got uh, jade here let's say jade has uh julia cedric and uh sir eric on her team and uh you know let's say we're in a pve scenario um i don't know i guess i don't really have to pull it out but let's say you got a uh uh, a, uh not a quest item a uh a prisoner Right, and I actually have done this in uh, the campaign where you have to release a prisoner and he runs with your team. We we used uh, this uh, heroic melody multiple times over and over because there's a time this character has to be running out and he doesn't get much movement. So being able to do that two additional movement, and then you know Juliet makes the two, two movement, Cedric gets to make two movement, Sir Eric gets to make two movement. I mean, that's that's just crazy. You can get your team around. You could get, you know, potentially somebody getting mobbed very easily. I mean, you, you got Juliet, 
I mean, obviously, Julia's not a great example. How about Sir Eric? We got Sir Eric and uh, um, Cedric here. You move Cedric, you know, let's say here and here. Boom. This person's mobbed. I mean, you, you even mob them even from here, too. Even, even this is considered as mobbed. But, you know, really start locking them in like that with uh, on each side. So getting that movement for your whole team is, uh, it, you know, it has to be allies that are within the range. But range 8 is, you know, for people who haven't played this game, range 8 is actually a lot of range. So you're covering most of the battlefield with a uh, range 8 type of uh, ability. Um, I mean, if you're standing on one edge, you got almost half the map, and then if you stand on the other side, you pretty much have almost half the other. So, you know, even being a few squares in, you know, you've covered almost all of it, or even being towards the center map, you have almost the entire map at your uh, disposal there. So, uh, fantastic ability, and then of course the empowered is a little bonus on top, but that movement is uh, really what makes it special. All right, let's go into her specials, which is uh, uh, just as uh, great as her primaries. The Inspire Greatness is one of my top favorite abilities for a character. So range eight, one enemy, 18 damage. So it's lower on damage sides, but you know, not not uh, you know, it's some damage for a healer, which is good. But really, it's this. The permanent effect, choose an ally within range, apply one helpful condition on it. This condition, except hasten, applies once per turn. So now you get to go here and go, oh, do I want to give somebody permanent bless, permanent protected, permanent hasten, toughened, empowered? Um, it's a great way to potentially you know, make someone permanent you know, damage increase or, or increase somebody's chances to getting hit. Or maybe you make your, your tank extra strong without him having to to use protected type abilities. Um, or even toughen, reduce some of the damage. I mean, toughen probably is not one of my favorite positive conditions. But uh, still, some, some of the other options are great. And you can place it on uh, any other ally within range. So, can't be Jade, but... Uh, uh, you know anybody else and so one of the things too is you can if you get a chest and this I guess this changed in the boss mode but if you get a uh, a chest and you regain uh, specials you could use this again and get another a different effect that you can place on another hero or that same hero um, anyway it's uh Actually, I don't know. Actually, I don't think you could put Inspire Greatness twice on the same person. Do you think you could? Inspire Greatness on the same person. Yeah, you might be able to. I don't think there's anything I've... that says you can't. Didn't Wasn't this part of the debate we were having a while ago? Well, it was about... Special, uh, our debate was about if you could get you know a special if it's been used... Um, and it's applied on somebody if you get it back does the does that you know affect essentially get pulled from the person that applied it right but it doesn't you get a second copy um but do you get to apply essentially essentially inspire greatness twice to a hero i don't know um i don't think there's anything that would prevent you from doing that it's a good question for Alex. Can yeah. you stack it and give someone two different? Uh, yeah, give them like blessed okay. and empowered would be a incredibly strong combination. Getting uh, plus three damage and increase your chance to uh, hit would be great. That'd be awesome. I think you could, but it's definitely a good question for. Him. Uh, anyway, so that is a, a great ability and getting that extra damage always, uh, always good. Moving on to Requiem of Spirit, uh, range 8, one ally, zero damage. The target regains 20 hit points, so this is her big heal, which is obviously way not as strong as Talia or Tamram's heal. Um, but, uh, you know, 20, 
20 health okay we'll, we'll take it but the better part is the second effect which an ally within range regains one spent special attack so you could be getting back um i mean pff, anything essentially right call the master be fantastic one getting trampled back um that we talked about previously uh, River of Blood, Shadow Dance, being able to move around the field. I'm, I'm mostly just going off of the guys that we've already covered. Uh, 10,000 Swords, being able to move around. Or the Dragon Spirit. Um, oh, so good. Yeah. Um, I, you know, the, the damage isn't great, but it makes sense for her because she's not supposed to be the strongest healer. She's supposed to apply all these additional effects and uh and benefits to her team rather than focusing on just doing a lot of damage she's way more so like you know when you compare all the healers tamram is just the guy he just does he just does crazy amount of healing and that's pretty much mostly what he does um talia she's got some defensive abilities and some uh, uh you know other type of uh effects management type stuff but uh she's still doing quite a bit of healing Ustar is like basically just a, a damage healer. He, he does he does some healing, but it's mostly he's he's going around doing damage. And then Jade is the lowest, uh, uh, or at least lower uh, healing healer, but she gets so many great effects to help her team. So she's super supportive of her team. Um, fantastic uh, healer. So looking at her uh, her uh, compendium here, very versatile. Uh, being able to use her at the right time is uh, fundamental for like those movements I told you about earlier. Uh, you know, being able to say like make that decision that I said earlier uh, of you got like Cedric here and and Sir Eric, um, being able to go oh hey I'm gonna mob this guy. You know, seeing that. And realizing, you know, or or knowing like, oh, well, Sir Eric's like going to be near a lava pit here. I'm not going to put him there. I'm going to put him, you know, like over here or something like that. Or, you know, pull, pull uh, you know, Cedric out if he's, you know, taking some damage and stuff like that. So n knowing those movements is always uh, a very important part of uh, Arena. Um, probably one of the most impar important parts, I'd say. And, uh, yeah, getting back special, spent special attacks is fantastic, and getting increased chance on crits, and, ugh, yeah. All around fantastic hero, definitely. Um, ah, I don't know. I, I feel like I can't say I have a favorite. They're just all so good. I think Ustar is maybe my least favorite, even though he's got a lot of cool damage stuff. Um, but I like all the others so, so much. What do you think uh, about Jade? I mean, before I said people about Talia that she's the best healer, I think Jade is the most versatile healer and probably questionably one of the best support characters in the game. Yes. So Definitely. I'd put her in probably like top two, top three for best support characters. Right. And, and um, so when I say that, I, I mean that, you know, like it's not just about healing. It's about doing other things to help your team that's, um, you know, can be through healing, but it can be through movement or conditions or, you know, effects. So I exactly. And because of that, I love what Jake can bring to the table, especially on your team in both PVE and PVP. So, um, <laughs> There's out of the healers, it's good to be better between Natalia and Jade. So, um, but Jade having the ability to apply hastened and critical strikes to 17 or empowered or inspire greatness, giving you know helpful conditions. I mean, it's crazy. You know, some situations she can just like get you out of because of that those abilities so yep she she's extremely powerful she may not especially, heal as much. especially if she's played really well she can be extremely powerful and, and i think that's why the handling is at a two yeah. um someone's you know new to the game 
I don't think they're going to walk in with Jaden and all of a sudden be amazing and always no. being. In, so. Well, and like, for example, I'll, I'll point out the things that make Jade more challenging. One is uh, that um, being able to apply that effect that makes a primary attack criticals on rolls of 17 or more, you need to know who you're putting it on, right? right. You don't want to be putting it on your, your tank, essentially, because... You know, I mean, you can, it won't be the end of the world, but the idea is you're going to be trying to do, you know, more damage. So you're probably going to want to pr try to put it on a high damage character and not, and somebody that has a, a much better chance of getting that 17 or more. So then you look at characters like Katar, for example, him doing mighty blow because he gets a better chance to, uh, uh, you know, he gets a bonus to his role. So if that bonus gets him over, then uh, then he'll be doing a, a critical hit. So that that's one of the items. Then you got uh, you know that movement which we talked about earlier, where being able to see the good positions and where to get people in and out of, um, and then choosing the right buff to benefit your team. I mean, you don't. It's not going to be an end game if you don't pick like a, a great one or, or if you put it not on the optimum character, but it can be better if you if you pick, you know, who, who really needs it. And then uh, being able to choose who is going to get their special pack, uh, attack back from um, uh, from a because it doesn't have to be the person that's getting healed with Wrecking of Spirit. So it can be anybody else on your team that uh, wants to get a special back. Right. Who, who is the most per you know important person to get that back? And so some specials. there's just there's a, those opportunities, right? You gotta, right. You gotta think about what what are the best opportunities. And putting the right special back on a certain character could be all the difference in a game. Yep. So she's very strong character. So I really like Jade, and I think. Probably one of the best sports in the game, if not the best. Yeah. So here's her uh, her new model. It is definitely different from her original one. It's a little more combative type pose than the other one, where she's kind of just standing around. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people have made some comments about like, and you can't really see it great in this picture that's provided on the tabletop simulator, but. Uh, uh, the sheath that she has for her dagger in this new model, there's absolutely no way that she could ever get her dagger back into that sheath. It's physically impossible. <laughs> um, it's one of those like silly things I saw someone point out, and it was like, yeah, that actually is kind of true. Like, There's no way she could ever get that back in, but... Uh, another fun little fact about Jade too is she's actually supposed, lore-wise, she's supposed to be the youngest uh, hero out of all the uh, arena heroes. Um, in fact, I think there's a whole section in the art book where they talked about like originally they had her looking even younger, uh, and it looked like she was like just a little kid type thing, and they decided to make her a little bit older. All right. Her, what was that? I'm just saying, I think the whole dagger thing threw a lot of people off, too, because you're expecting a bard-like character to play strumming on, you know, her instrument versus pulling out a dagger, so... Yeah. Um, not my most favorite... Yeah, um, not, not my favorite miniature. I do like it better than the original, but yes, definitely not my I favorite. But just want to throw that in there. Yeah. All right, well, that is all the hero characters, so let's move into what our healer is good with, and uh, basically kind of covered a little bit of that at the beginning. So healers, you know, like I said earlier, I'm considered, I consider as a core, um, core class, so they're really good with everybody. Um, you know, you, you can't really go too wrong with uh, a healer. Any team could be benefited by have any healer i'd say the the only teams that would probably suffer some from having a healer is a team that uses too little attack so let's say putting putting a tank and a healer 
Now this can be a little counterintuitive. There's plenty of examples that can be back and forth on this. Not always the best though, because for example, you can have Sir Eric, and, and this is not a a negative really either, because you could you could do this and it work out successfully as well. But putting like Sir Eric with another healer, he already does some healing. He you know he's got some of his toughen effects. He's he's got an interrupt, um, like you know like Tamram. Uh, that's actually pretty similar, but it's actually, it's even worse, but, uh, uh, anyway, so you put, put him with like Tamron, for example, and you know, it's not horrible. It's just, you know, they're, they're kind of overlapping some, but it's not the end of the world. They'll, they'll still be good together. Um, but if you had a team of like a healer and a tank and you had, let's say, uh, you know, a lower damage, like, you know, you had like a controller or something. Uh, and then you had, uh, let's say, Askren or whatever. He's one of the lower damage um, uh, bruisers. You're going to struggle a little bit uh, because your team is not going to be very high damage. Uh, so you're, you have a lot of like for, you know, and the reason why I use this example was because Sir Eric does healing and Askren does healing. So if you have another healer, you have three healers that are all healing, which is good, but sometimes it's a little just overuse and you're not going to really benefit from all that. So you would really more benefit from getting some more damage or other effects on your team. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, really good combinations of course is, Making sure to keep your, uh, you know, any melee characters. Uh, more often, melee characters kind of get can get focused down pretty easily. So getting brutes, you know, healers is really good. Uh, tacticians, uh, and then uh, you know some of the bruisers, um, or even like the special characters uh, definitely benefit from uh, that as well. But like I said earlier, they're kind of good with everyone. Um, I think I mentioned back and forth about some of the different characters. Ustar, you know, put in him with, you know, brutes, shooters, um, where he can take advantage of additional damage, or even maybe some of the the um, the bruisers. He could he could really benefit from uh, being able to use their abilities with uh, uh, with Harvest of Souls or or Vengeful Wraith. Um, so he's, he's good with those teams, uh, Talia, you know, all around great, great healer, Tamram all around great healer. You know, he's got an interrupt, which, uh, can be, can be really important for PVP. Um, but yeah, I mean, Jade, Ooh, Jade. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we talked, we talked about the Minotaur, um, Averlum. You can only use it once, but uh, uh, potentially, you know, so Averlum's going to make more strikes on most of his attacks, uh, or at least with like Arcane Blast, for example. Um, so if, let's say, he's going to attack three targets and uh, he, he's, he's making multiple strikes, but you put Angelic Voice on him, there's a much better chance that he's going to get a critical, hole, uh, critical role. Uh, because he's just he's just attacking more targets, so there's benefits to that. Neri has some similar stuff, so she can be uh, good for those combinations. Um, yeah, Juliet too. I mean, great because she gets to bless herself, which we talked about earlier. Get being able to bless uh, with that uh, uh, chance to crit is a great one. Um, anyway, so. Uh, I, I'd say, uh, Jade and Askren, um, so they both get abilities that get to apply beneficial conditions, um, like, uh, Celestial Armor, where he gets to toughen an ally and bless them, uh, and then being able to get a second Celestial Armor from, like, Wreck Requiem of Squir Spir uh, Spirit and being able to put, like, Inspire Greatness. I mean, you can really buff somebody out with just those two heroes alone. Um, 
so that's uh, that's a great combination. Um, uh, Rorik, you can help help keep him uh, pretty pretty topped up uh, health wise, but not uh, not horrible. Anyway, yeah, I think uh, you know the the healers are just so good that y you can apply them pretty much with most teams, and you're not gonna really be struggling that much. And and they don't suffer quite as much from the uh, PVE versus PVP thing that we talked about, like last week, for example, with uh, like Garen. Um, so they, you know, Ustar is really the only guy that may be affected a little bit more, but uh, otherwise they're they're pretty pretty versatile all around. So anyway, anything else you want to cover, uh, Code? Um. Mm, healer <laughs> most times you're gonna want to pick a healer for your team um but i think you pointed out that they're they're not restricted by um mostly this one's for pvp or this one's for pve other than ustar but um yeah i think they did an excellent job on the healers to be honest yeah not to say they haven't on the other classes but just that these are very useful in most of the game modes, so gotta yeah. give them a little applaud for that one. Well, and so, you know, sp speaking of team synergies, uh, so I have actually played, you know, s different matches without a healer, so one thing to note is any, and, and this might have changed now because Dragori did make some changes to the rules um, for bosses, but previously taking a healer to a boss wasn't very beneficial and the reason that was was because bosses do so much damage that uh, um, basically you know your healer can be you know doing all the heals that they can just doing heals over and over but your team's going to take like 20 damage hits over and over so you know doing like eight heal or maybe even up to 12 or something like with uh tamram and and in combination with like divine grace or something um isn't necessarily going to keep you know everybody alive so they're not that they're bad they're still good but you're trading off you know like we saw looking at um all the different compendium uh damage values all the healers are much lower damage than the classes that we've seen previously so you got to keep that in mind. You're you're trading utility team support for damage. So uh, for boss fights, that's makes it a little more challenging because you really do need that damage. Uh, regular campaign missions, it's actually a lot better to have a healer because the damage isn't like applied so you know it's it's not um, you know direct damage that's hitting you the whole time often. You're uh, just taking damage over time, so it's a little easier for healers to manage there, and they, they benefit more from that team team support. Um, but I would suggest anybody that is you know just starting uh, Arena the contest and trying to um, uh, you know put put together their first teams, put a put a healer in there for sure because uh, I think most people are going to do better uh try and try not the healer one of the healers to start their first team with and uh try and you know say like just a bruiser or or essentially going without a healer i think so it's your first time put put a healer in the team and um kind of leads into my next segment which is uh the announcements we have so on saturday we will be doing, uh, we will be Spiel Digital on the 24th of uh, October here. It's going to be going at 9 a.m. Uh, uh, my time, which is Central uh, Daylight Savings Time right now. And uh, Germany time, I think that's 4 p.m. So uh, it will, you know, this is a German event. So uh, uh, it's going to be kind of more centered towards those, those time. But anyway, specifically, Jagori asked for me to do a stream covering basics on uh, Arena the Contest. So we'll be going over, you know, super, you know, basic stuff, right? 
rules like you, you know, you can only pick one hero of each class and, you know, you, you have movement that's equal to your movement stat and, um, you know, putting your, your, you know, things on the board, what are conditions and, um, we might go over like reaction attacks and focus, you know, stuff, but, you know, cover, cover more than just the main things like, uh, making sure you get your, uh, passives covered and, um, you know, wh where to use abilities when you need to. And anyway, so, and then we'll be going over team compositions. And so I plan to, uh, include some pretty simple, basic team strategies, um, to put together for, for new people that haven't played and, um, should give you an idea of, uh, so something to start with if you, uh, want to and, uh, should, should be, uh, yeah, good, good, good teams to get going with arena, the contest. So, all right. Well, anything else, uh, you want to talk about code? Oh yeah. Code's going to be there too. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. It's going to be, that's good. Uh, even if you know, the game is good, probably a refresh refresher on, um, just the game itself. So definitely come out and uh, check Jagori's digital booth. I think it starts the 22nd. It's not just the Saturday. It's yes, Thursday. Right. Yep, that is a good point. So it actually starts on Thursday and it goes through Sunday. Um, we're only going to be streaming at this one particular time. Uh, well, you know, now that I think about it, I guess since it does go Sunday, I don't know what time the, the convention officially closes on Sunday. Um, but I'm assuming that, uh, I guess with the time zones and everything, even, you know, if we're doing our stream on Sunday, which I, I've been contemplating if we're going to do that or not, um, that, uh, uh, that it would already be past the, the time for the convention anyway, but yeah. yeah. Um, but other than that. Definitely check out their booth. They're going to have some reveals for the RPG book. Um, so if you have not ordered the game, I think they're giving chance to get Kickstarter prices on some of the Tenaris Adventures. Yep, that's accurate. And I did confirm uh, as well that if you have not already uh, been in the Kickstarter and you're like a late backer and you missed the first wave, but you still want to try to get this game before, uh, you know, having to wait till later next year is, um, you can during this weekend, you know, this weekend only, uh, this weekend only, uh, <laughs> uh, you will be able to get into the, uh, wave one pledge manager as well. So, uh, in fact, you can even get it in that that first wave. So if you get in and you order your stuff, um, you, you could get it in uh, what January, February. Maybe I mean yeah. we don't know exact times yet, but that's kind of what we're estimating right now for people that don't already own um, the core box and Dragon Collection. Well, I mean nobody has, owns Dragon Collection yet, but being able to get that early and um, get your reworked miniatures early and everything. So, I think that's. I, I didn't know it was wave one, but that's excellent. I mean, if you're on the fence, maybe just you know get the core box to start, and if you love it, you can go into wave two and get everything else. I think possibly. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of hoping that the the wave two pledge manager will be open past people receiving wave one, so if people do change their mind, then they you know. Like they only got the core box and then they get it and they're like, oh my God, this game's amazing. Then they are going to, you know, be able to add on those other items and, and, uh, play start playing Tenaris adventures too. Yeah. I mean, or get things that they missed out on, you know? Yeah. There, there, there's a lot more down the pipe. I mean, wave two, I think that's the plan to be a little bit later next year. Cause I know. We're going to be getting the RPG Kickstarter sometime in the beginning. Which they after. will be uh, providing some information about at, uh, at this event. So, it, it's, there's a lot going on. So, uh, definitely check it out. This Thursday it starts. Check us out Saturday. and. 
that's that's it for me, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching, and uh, hope this helps uh, anyone that's really trying to learn all about the classes and the heroes of Arena, and get some tips on uh, how to play the game, or or clarifications potentially on uh, some of the the uh, different heroes. I have gotten some comments that were pretty good, so keep them up. Uh, it's always uh, really good to see some of these really intricate questions that I hadn't even considered and uh, someone throws out. So keep them coming and let me know uh, what things you did, didn't like in our video. And, uh, you know, I got the webcam thing going now. So let me know if you like uh, that or if there's anything particular you want to see in the physical version or, or uh, wh whatever. Um, so next week we'll be doing that uh, stream like we talked about. And then uh, it's still undecided if we'll be doing a stream on a week from today on Sunday or not. But um, if we don't, then we'll probably be picking up uh, the class spotlight the weekend after that. So let me know what uh, what class you'd like to see next as well. So. All right. Well, that's it. Thanks for uh, watching and we'll see you later.